Good day, everyone. Welcome to the final day of the 13th Asia Euro People's Forum. It has been a marathon over the last seven days, and uh, we are really excited for this uh, closing day with all these exciting events that we are uh, anticipating and, and that will happen today. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for, for, for uh, coming here this morning, this afternoon, or for those of you. My name is Dorothy Guerrero. I'm with Global Justice Now, which is one of the members of the organizing committee of the Asia Euro People Forum. The other organizations within the IOC are the following. 1111 Coalition, based in Belgium. The Asian People's Movement on Debt and Development, uh, based in the Philippines, but it's an Asian regional group. Attack Fronts, Ecologistas en Acción in Spain, Focus on the Global South in Asia, Fresh Eyes from here in the UK, Global Justice Indonesia, Global Justice Now UK, Global Social Justice Belgium, Institute for Popular Democracy in the Philippines, the Mongolia AEPF Committee, Monitoring Sustainability of Globalization in Malaysia, Stiftung ASEAN House in Germany, Transnational Institute in the Netherlands, and the Vietnam Peace and Development Foundation. So all these organizations brought these eight days of events and interlinked dialogue. Our AEPF is a biennial conference that addresses the governments within the Asia-Europe meeting, which involves 21 Asian countries in the ASEAN Secretariat, along with the European Union and 27 member states, states plus Norway, Switzerland, and the United Kingdom. The network was set up in 1996, and through the years, the AEPF developed into an interregional network of social movements and progressive civil society organizations from across two regions. We also seek dialogue with parliamentarians to present concerns common to organizations from both regions that are linked to our themes of social justice, climate change, growing inequality, and peace. We have developed close relationship with those that support our campaigns. In the last seven days, we held 42 interrelated events attended by participants from 45 countries, yay, which featured presentations and testimonies from leaders and representatives of social movements, trade unions, campaign organizations, progressive researchers and members of the academe, as well as progressive politicians. So we introduced this session of interface with parliamentarians for the first time in the last Asia Euro People's Forum held in Ghent in Belgium in 2018. So now to formally also start the discussions and presentations and, and um, the people's agenda to be presented to our uh, parliamentarians, I now want to call Charles Santiago. Charles had been um, a long time advocate and uh, one of the founding members of the AEPF uh, before he turned to politics. Um, he is an MP in, in Malaysia, and at the same time, he's also the chairperson for the ASEAN Human Rights Committee. So over to you, Charles, and good morning. Uh, thanks, uh, Dorothy, for the introduction. And let me express my greetings of peace and solidarity uh, to all uh, our speakers, guests, uh, as well as all those who are joining us uh, in this uh, platform. Uh, in the last one week, the Asia Europe People's Forum had successfully put together more than 42 different panel discussions, 42 panel discussions involving, uh, as Dr. said, 45 different countries involving very many uh, uh, topics. A central point, uh, in my view, uh, that seems to be appearing in a variety of ways is that the socio-political and economic, uh, including environmental realities of Asia and Europe, have worsened over the last one year have worsened over the last uh, one year. Existing inequalities have worsened. Uh, whatever small gains, little gains in the fight against poverty, inequality, or healthcare, or education has been reversed in a big way uh, in Asia. Uh, existing social protection policies are also underfunded, underfunded, lacks coverage, uh, or minuscule that it has no impact on vulnerable communities. Especially social protection is so important in, in, at this very moment in time. Uh, especially in uh, the developing South, uh, and you find, as I said, uh, underfunded, lacks of coverage, and the informal sector has been kept completely outside in some countries in the context of social protection. 
the pandemic has exposed has exposed the government's inability the government's inability to respond effectively to vulnerable communities whether they are workers whether they are refugees or whether they are migrants this is largely because provisioning of healthcare uh, utilities such as water electricity uh, education is now forced through the markets almost all of our governments are new liberal uh, and a pro market unfortunately governments have become regulators and subservient to business especially big businesses the pandemic has also seen another development another trend which has pushed billionaire billionaires to become trillionaires uh, especially in the the platform economy it has created pharma uh, vaccine billionaires as well and on the other hand it has also pushed millions millions of people deeper into poverty into into despair and death this is the unfortunate reality of our society it has always been there and i think the last one year has just made it worse is this grim reality what is the role of parliaments what is the role of parliaments and what is the role of progressive uh, parliamentarians if i can use the expression progressive parliamentarians how do we as progressive progressive parliamentarians pass through the issues in our work in the various legislative bodies in the last uh, one week 42 uh, uh, different panels talked about healthcare talked about democracy talked about social protection talked about environmental degradation uh, move away from fossil fuels to renewable energy a whole variety of stuff so how how do we as progressive parliamentarians pass through some of these issues in our work in the various legislative bodies so this is the question that we have to discuss and ponder in the next couple of minutes or couple of we one hour how do we push government this is critical how do we push governments uh, uh political parties power centers media to develop and implement policies uh, towards a democratic accountability gender equality human rights closing the gap between the rich and the poor and most urgently a people's vaccine people's vaccine in my view is very urgent at this time there might be many approaches to do this to push the governments in certain way but i think uh, one strategy that you know we can talk about uh, is that we want to think about as a way to reset as a way to reset power relations in our legislative bodies to rethink reset the power relations in our legislative bodies and the reset is based on a partnership and an interface between parliamentarians on one side trade unions women's organizations ngos working together to push progressive ideas and mobilizing on those ideas in the context of the legislative body itself and the interface happens with this within the scope of work of the legislative body so it's not something that happens outside of parliament or the the various uh, legislative bodies but it happens at the center at the center of the various discussions that are happening in parliament itself i leave this at this time uh, not as an idea uh, and a collective challenge that we can think about uh, given that i only have 5 minutes and i've already uh, covered quite a bit of 5 minutes and i think this is something that we have to think about how uh, the stakeholders their issues their aspirations and their views is brought within the discussions of the legislative body in order before it becomes policy, uh, before it becomes law uh, and i think it's something that we should think about the interface the interface the interface and a partnership between various stakeholders in the context of the legislative body uh, this requires a reset especially in power equilibrium power balance uh, both in in government as well uh, as in the legislative bodies that we are all part of with this i stop and thank you very much Thank you Charles and um Charles has been with us uh, from the beginning and also from inside and outside governments uh he's a very reliable partner of Asia Europe People's Forum. So for for the next uh part I would um this will be the presentation of the people's um agenda that have been developed um it's quite an elaborate process with all the different clusters contributing to it and also based from different events so i would now want to call andy rutherford from fresh eyes who's also a member of our international organizing committee andy 
Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Dottie, and thank you, Charles, and a very good day, everybody. Uh, simple background is since the Asia Europe People's Forum began, uh, at the end of each of our uh, forums, we have earnestly and uh, comprehensively brought together our core demands, our core aspirations, our core visions for change, for progressive and people-centered change. And over the years, these have become significant, both in their content and in their size. And it has been uh, a commitment over the last year to bring those together into something more concise, uh, which can be our presentation to all parliamentarians to act as a synthesis of what we feel are the key and core visions for our common futures. And we have brought these together under what we call uh, ambitiously and honestly, a people's charter. And the people's charter is what we are, what I will be presenting on behalf of the Asia Europe People's Forum to parliamentarians everywhere, but specifically to uh, the eight parliamentarians which are, who are joining us today. So the People's Charter for ASEM Parliamentarians. Every person on this planet shares a common humanity. We all want our children to grow up healthy, to have good education, have decent work, drink clean water, breathe clean air, and live in peace. If we can move through the slides, that will be excellent. Thank you. Our governments have deflected progressive calls to protect the planet and protect its people. We all need urgent and people-centered collective and national responses for our common futures. Today, we call on our governments to work with citizens, including poor, excluded and marginalized people, including migrant and refugee peoples, to develop and implement policies and more accountable and democratic institutions. that will lead to a just, equal, inclusive and sustainable Asia and Europe. This has to be based on respect for gender equality, our environment and fundamental human rights. To do this, as citizens, organizations and movements endorsing the People's Charter, we call upon parliamentarians, governments and governments to develop legislation and to mobilize resources for the following. First, universal, comprehensive and legislated social protection. This is through free, publicly financed and managed healthcare, enabling healthcare for all. Free, universal, public, quality education for all. Decent shelter for all. Decent work and livelihoods based on decent work. Universal basic, universal guaranteed basic income for people who are ill, are unemployed, people with disabilities, and a living decent pension for all. Promote, promote equality for all, regardless of class, ethnicity, nationality, race, caste, religion, sexual orientation, gender, including gender identity and expression and age, all in fulfillment of international human rights law. Through initiating comprehensive programs to end gender-based violence, through ratifying the Geneva Convention relating to the status of refugees and the UN Convention on the protection of the rights of all migrant workers and members of their families. All countries should adopt legal provisions for immigration, for granting asylum, and for protecting stateless people. Climate justice and just transitions. 
Just transitions means transitions from the corporate extraction of resources and the exploitation of people to the restoration and regeneration of our earth and our climate and our people's rights and dignity. Promoting and defending participatory democracy is core to our just transitions. We advocate promoting climate justice by stopping the expansion of fossil fuel energy production and consumption, ending government subsidies and public handouts to dirty energy and related companies and divest from fossil fuel companies, having concrete short-term and medium-term plans for appropriate emissions reduction to ensure the possibility that 1.5 limit will be still possible, so potentially, potentially preventing a climate catastrophe. To take forward appropriate legislation to enable the following as a matter of urgency. To commit to 100% renewable energy for all. To pledge the finance necessary to build democratic renewable energy systems for communities and ensure just transitions, to ban fracking and new gas projects, and adopt a global moratorium on fossil, new fossil fuel exploration and extraction and new coal projects, and to announce a phase out of public subsidies for fossil fuels. The Green New Deal. The Green New Deal is an ambitious plan for how we can eliminate poverty and create millions of jobs while tackling the biggest threat to our, cli our, our time, climate change. It involves massive public investment in clean energy, transport and climate adaptation work. A global Green New Deal is about transforming all our societies to be safer and fairer and enabling everyone to live a better life through zero emissions economies, publicly owned clean sustainable energy, the restructuring of all industries, manufacturing, agriculture, transport, construction and tourism, enabling the regeneration and development of biodiversity, promoting food sovereignty, sustainable organic agriculture and peasant agriculture, agroecology, sorry, creating common village level seed banks to decrease dependency on commercial seeds and protecting our commons against privatization, recognizing, respecting and protecting ancestral domains and territories of indigenous peoples. A fair, just and sustainable financial systems through delivering tax justice by stopping tax evasion and implementing a progressive tax system in which big corporations and wealthy individuals pay the highest taxes wherever they live and operate. Ending illicit financial flows and tax havens. Taking serious steps to cut military expenditures and transfer resources to social justice. The abolition of illegitimate and unsustainable debt held by governments. Ensuring public scrutiny and democratic control over trade and investment negotiations. Establishing constructive cooperation with the initiatives at the UN to achieve an international legally binding instrument on transnational corporations and other business enterprises, the UN binding treaty. And permanently restricting the use of investor state dispute settlement. Now, <clears throat> now we have a common need to build a just, equal, inclusive and sustainable Asia and Europe and, a, and more accountable and democratic institutions based on respect for gender equality, our environment and fundamental human rights. A people's charter is essential for our common futures to take us all closer to a just, equitable, 
resilient, post-carbon, sustainable world. We commit to actively lobby and engage with parliamentarians and elected representatives and decision makers to make this become a lived reality in our lifetimes. This is our people's charter and we pledge to work with parliamentarians wherever possible to enable this to be our common lived reality. Thank you all. Thank you, Andy. And um, well, we have a lot to discuss then in that people's agenda. So I now wanted to call back Charles again, um, also to, to respond on the, this general people's charter um, and also share with, share with us his reflections on it, um, its relevance and how to take it forward. Um, in the, in the uh, thanks, region. thanks, Dorothy. Uh, and thanks, Andy, for that um, well thought out uh, and uh, people's charter. And I must congratulate the committee that worked on it because normally it's about 10 pages, uh, but it is very concise. It's very clear to understand. You can't miss it. No, no ambiguities. It's up to the point. So it's on, on the dot. Uh, I think uh, compared to the previous years, uh, I think there's been a major development on climate justice and transition. Uh, I think a sort of work has been done in the last two years on, uh, on, the, on the first. And then the Global Green New Deal. Uh, this, I think, will be the first time where it, uh, the uh, Asia Europe People's Forum uh, is taking a position and a progressive one uh, in pointing the direction that uh, others, other uh, stakeholders uh, could follow and could emulate. Uh, I, in, in principle, I support this. I support the, the People's Charter. Uh, and I'd like to just make a, su a suggestion on how to go forward, how to go forward uh, with the People's Charter. And let me just uh, give you an example of uh, how we, we have done it over the uh, issue of Myanmar uh, and uh, how, this, how it is working, uh, at least at this stage, and where we can take up some of these ideas, whether it is uh, social protection, uh, whether it's uh, just trans climate justice and uh, just transactions uh, or transitions or just transitions, a uh, Green New Deal, which has got a lot of uh, uh, traction all over the world right now, or even the uh, fair, just and sustainable financial systems. So we, we have uh, how to take this further. Now, what uh, there's an experiment that we, were, we worked in Southeast Asia. And this is where we have got the ASEAN parliamentarians for human rights reaching out to all the parliamentarians of the world, uh, from uh, right up from North, uh, from the United States to Africa and Japan and, and the Europeans. So what we have done is we said, hey, listen, Myanmar needs our support. Myanmar needs our attention at this time. And we would like to set up the International Parliamentarians Alliance for Myanmar. Uh, and we didn't think it will start off actually, but it was a very good start. Uh, we had a first 40 parliamentarians, uh, largely from Europe, uh, from America, or two from America, not so many, uh, from Japan, Korea, and ASEAN, 40 of them who had come on board in the various discussions that we have had since, uh, I think, March. Uh, we have had, uh, what do you call it, discussions on... Um, on sanctions, uh, on how Tamadov, for example, how the army works in the country, uh, on humanitarian aid, uh, the crisis uh, in the ethnic states, and so on and so forth. And at every meeting, you will have a minimum of 30 to 40 people, and the whole uh, participating in the process. The whole point of that exercise is to ensure that parliamentarians are informed. Parliamentarians are informed. Uh, and up to date on the developments in Myanmar so that they can actually course it through their own parliaments, their own select committees, and also discuss with their own governments, uh, whichever department uh, that's involved in the case of Myanmar. So my proposal would be, like for example, if you take the right to dissent, for example, or the green, uh, green, uh, uh, green uh, global uh, green new deal, for example, 
we could take one or two, or both or one, and try the experiment where we invite, where the Asia Europe People's Forum invites concern or individuals or MPs in different parts of the world to come together to form a parliamentary coalition of, say, the right to dissent, for example, or the Global Green New Deal, for example. So I think in that way, we can get as many parliamentarians as possible uh, involved and also inform the parliamentarians on the developments that are taking place in other parts of the world, which would need their attention, uh, share policies that are being developed by individual academics or people who are in the environmental group uh, and do and become a resource that we can feed through the various parliamentary uh, parliament, parliamentarians in their parliamentary discussions in parliament, in the select committees, in the caucuses, and also in their own political parties. So I think uh, the, the, challenge, the challenge now is to make that work, make that work. And today we have a good number of parliamentarians with us, although largely uh, coming from Europe. Uh, I think, for example, we could try it out and see how it works. For example, in the case of uh, the International Parliamentarian Alliance for Myanmar, uh, we, uh, Heidi is involved, Heidi Hartla is involved, and she chaired one of those meetings. So we, 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 there's a, we, we shift the chairpersons at every meeting so that everybody gets a chance to chair, to be involved, and also to make suggestions and so on and so forth. So, um, so the next meeting we will have one involving the CNR, uh, the, uh, the parliamentarians in Myanmar talking about their issues, and will be chaired by a senator from uh, from Australia, for example. So I think we could try something like this as a way of concretizing, as a way of concretizing and as a way of taking forward some of the issues or critical issues uh, challenge uh, facing society uh, that has been written, very well written, very well captured in the People's Charter. Uh, I see this charter as a major development, a major growth is taking place. Uh, and I think uh, another issue that we could have been uh, developed a bit more would be on the people's vaccine. I think the people's vaccine and its link to intellectual property rights are critical at this moment. It is a question of life and death. Nothing is more important than that. Life and death is critical. So we could have prioritized uh, uh, the issue of people's vaccine, especially in the context of how intellectual property rights are used by big pharma in order to to uh, to um, uh, stop uh, developing countries from you know uh, producing generically. Uh, so this is an issue that we could have. So the fight is already on, and AP Asia Europe People's Forum can participate in that struggle on behalf of the developing world and on behalf of Europeans who are also having problems uh, with the vaccine. Uh, I think this is quite important. How IPR is being used. This is critical how IPR has been used to deny people medicine, to deny people life. Uh, and as you know, we have seven new billionaires who have come into being. These are called the vaccine billionaires, the vaccine billionaires. And what do you have on the other side? Millions of people dying. Uh, and all because some of these countries, some of these uh, uh, corporations have IPR uh, in their name and therefore they hold the whole world hostage. This is dangerous, though, and this is the challenge that parliamentarians have to take up at, the, at their own legislative assemblies uh, as well as in other fora. I'll stop at that. Thank you, Dr. Okay, thank you very much, Charles. In, indeed, the, the issue of, of the vaccine apartheid has been part of many, many discussions over the last seven days, and uh, this is one of the stark, uh, we see difference between the nations in Europe and in, in Asia. And, um, I, and I could see that this will be a, a major campaign uh, in the many months and years, to, and years to come because for many developing countries, they are seeing that uh, they might have access to the COVID-19 vaccines by 2024, which in this period of global pandemic, is unacceptable because that would mean mutations can happen and even the current vaccines may no longer be effective uh, for those new mutations. So um, at the moment we have um, around 130 participants coming from all over. I will read the countries later. And we also have more than 100 following us on Facebook. So this is uh, the good attendance. 
And uh, again, thank you all for, for, for joining us. I would like to encourage again, everyone to use the chat, make it lively, put your comments, uh, tell us where you're coming from, your organizations and who you are. So let's make that lively. So for the next um, speaker, uh, Charles already mentioned her and she's also um, a, a very good partner, longtime supporter, also of the Asian Euro People's Forum. I remember uh, many of us met her in Helsinki during the AEPF 8 and, and was also in AEPF 9 in Vientiane. So uh, without much further ado, I would like now to call Heidi Hautula. She's a member of the European Parliament from Finland and on her fifth term now in the, in the EP. Thanks, Heidi. Hello, good morning from Finland. I'm not under completely ideal conditions. I have to drive uh, from my country place to Helsinki to catch a plane to Paris and then further try to make my way to, to Brussels. But um, anyway, um, uh, it's, it's so good to see that the Asian European People's Forum is well and uh, alive and that has created this uh, very, very interesting charter that I can fully endorse um, and uh, see how we can um, uh, respond to, to many of the proposals. And, but I must say that um, many of those proposals, um, surprisingly, um, are very much on the agenda of, of my parliament, the European Parliament. And um, uh, with the uh, introduction of the European Green Deal, which in fact is very much the implementation an attempt to implement the sustainable development goals of the UN, the, the Agenda 2030, uh, we have uh, treaded on a, on a new path. I'm not saying, and I, I don't want to be naive to say that there are no obstacles. Of course, there are many obstacles, many opponents, many feel their privileges are threatened, but there's a genuine attempt to combine social, ecological and economical dimensions to a just system. Um, in particular, I'm, I'm happy to tell you that um, the um, implementation of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights is advancing uh, very well. Um, again, not without obstacles, not without uh, some of the corporate world saying that now this only adds to bureaucracy and we don't need to be accountable for all of our value chains, whether in terms of human rights, environmental or governance. But that's what we're trying to do. So um, this means that um, a, a continent that <laughs> is, of course, not at all um, uh, unguilty, innocent in terms of exploitation of natural resources, energy, with very high consumption levels, and with, um, I would say, uh, about 30% of our um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions are imported emissions through consumption, but there's been so much attention on deforestation, forced labor, child labor, and uh, other aspects of exploitation of, um, of people and the planet, that now there is a completely different approach to the whole question. So I hope to be announcing you in the autumn that we are close to, to achieving my mandatory legislation on human rights and environmental due diligence. Uh, so, um, uh, Charles Santiago, of course, a good friend, uh, has uh, mentioned the, the work on Myanmar, and it shows us that there is a potential for parliamentarians supporting the goals that the AEPF is, uh, is uh, dedicating to, to broaden that to other areas. And I would, of course, give my full support to this idea that Charles has just aired. And um, I want to thank uh, him and uh, the, Asia, the ASEAN uh, parliamentarians for human rights, again, taking a very important uh, initiative and lead. So, um, I think there's not very much more besides saying that, of course, there's, a, there's an issue that also needs to be addressed, that we are seeing many different kinds of autocracies um, uh, taking over people's rights. And we, we should try to find ways to defend people who, at the moment, have no right to dissent, who are being threatened and uh, whose rights are being denied because they express a different opinion. Of course, uh, the, the situation in Myanmar deserves all our attention, and there are many, many more countries where, where we see that uh, things are not going to the right way. Things are not going for more democratic, more social, uh, more ecological 
uh, direction. So we have to remember the political rights as well as essential part of human rights. And lastly, I'd like to say that I'm very happy to see that in this uh, charter, there's a strong uh, gender dimension. Uh, this is uh, is indeed important. So um, I, I'm, I'm going to follow and I, I try to, to address questions, but I don't think I will be able to, to read uh, the chat, but I wish you all very well. I have very fond memories of our Asian European People's Forums from Helsinki to Beijing, and uh, I look forward to working with you also as parliamentarians again. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi, and uh, have a good trip. And, and, and we really greatly appreciate uh, this commitment that while you're driving, you're joining and listening to us. Um, we, now, uh, we will now go to the next uh, uh, portion of this event, which is uh, the responses from uh, six progressive uh, members of parliament uh, from Europe and Asia to respond directly to specific people ag people's agenda in, in the charter. And um, we, are not, we are giving them five minutes to present the views and respond to AEPF uh, in each of these uh, people's agenda. So first, um, I would like to call uh, Natalie Bennett. Uh, she's the uh, former leader of the Green Party of uh, England and Wales. Uh, she's now uh, in the, uh, a member of the House of Lords here in the UK. Uh, still with the Green Party, England and Wales. So Natalie, thank you for joining us and uh, the mic is yours. Thank you very much, Dorothy. And it's lovely to be with everybody this morning. Um, those who are um, listening to me and thinking um, that's a, a rather strange uh, British accent, that's because the accent comes originally from Australia. Uh, I grew up on the lands of the Walla Medigal uh, people uh, land stolen from them in northern Sydney um, and it's also particularly delightful to be joining you because I was actually in Bangkok when the first ASEM 01 government meeting was occurring. I was a volunteer at the National Commission on Women's Affairs in Thailand. I lived in Thailand for five years so I'm feeling quite at home this morning at an at, at Asia uh, a Europe meeting. Um, and I wanted to begin by applauding the having listened to the the, uh, the declaration being set out. Um, the, one of the things that I really focused on was uh, a commitment in there by people signing up to the declaration to actively lobby and engage. And I think that's terribly important. That politics should be what you do, not have done to you, is something that I very much want to focus. Uh, there's a feeling that you oh, it's, the world's terribly difficult and it's complicated and we have to leave it to the experts. I think it's absolutely crucial that we say, yes, experts can give us great advice on, you know, what sort of renewable energy we should use, et cetera. But deciding the direction of our societies is something that needs to happen, starting at the absolutely local level and moving upwards only when absolutely necessary. So people deciding their own future, that democracy has to be absolutely foundational. And I think we also very much have to get across the idea. We were talking there about education, health, a decent income for all. And I would actually go further. I, I think the declaration says guarantee that um, everyone who needs it has a universal basic income. I would like to see simply a universal basic income going to everyone as a human right. And that means nobody falls through the cracks. Um, but behind that, I think, is an understanding of something we really need to tackle, which is the idea of scarcity versus the idea of, um, of abundance. And I would say that there is enough resources for everyone on this planet to have a decent life if we just share them out fairly. Um, and that second part is where we're very, very substantially falling down, where the world has fallen down over very long periods of time. Um, and talking about the Green New Deal, and I'm very pleased to see the focus on the Green New Deal there. But I think it's really important to stress because sometimes what the Green New Deal is, um, there's a kind of feeling that it's solar panels, it's um, you know installation of new energy efficiency technology. It is of course all of those things, uh, but that implies a business as usual, the economy, our lives going on as they are now and just changing the technology. And the Green New Deal is something much more than business as usual with added technology. The kind of transformations that 
I talk about is the universal basic income, meaning everyone has income. I would also say, you know, let's work towards a, a four day working week of standard with no loss of pay as a starting point, maybe eventually going down to a three day working week as standard. And that's something that people get more time in their lives. Um, and it also, we put less play pressure on the planet. Uh, and I think when we're talking about environmentally friendly things, renewable energy and all the rest, um, it's really crucial to stress that um, traditionally, historically, there's been a, oh, we've got to do these green things, we've got to find the money from somewhere, and, you know, we're, we're going to have to give up things. I think it's really crucial to say that the society we have now, the economic structures we have now, are trashing, on a global scale, are trashing the planet whilst giving people a very, very unhealthy life. You know, we have um, around the world a epidemic, not just of COVID, which is, of course, related to how we've been treating the planet, but also an epidemic of mental ill health, an epidemic of stress and fear and insecurity. And those are all things that we need to actually, you know, the, the jargon in the, in the climate talks is co-benefits. You know, if we actually you know, get a situation where the streets are safe, the air is clean, people can walk and cycle for most of their shorter distance journeys. Um, that's also good for tackling obesity, it's good for health, it's good for mental well-being. All of those co-benefits, having warm, affordable, comfortable to heat homes for everyone who needs them in colder parts of the world, decently ventilated, well-made ones in warmer parts, um, those are all things that have health benefits, have economic benefits, have benefits in so many different ways. And I think there's one thing I was really pleased to hear the word agroecology in there in the in the declaration. Um, my first degree is agricultural science, and I'm always very interested in these areas. And one of the things that I think we can do very well in campaigning on and talking about is um, about food. Everyone eats. It's a great campaigning tool to ensure that everyone has, has access to healthy, genuinely affordable tasty let's not forget the tasty bit of the food as well and talking about food security these are really big issues so um, I'm probably just about coming up to my five minutes so I did want to say it was a great pleasure to follow Heidi um, the UK sadly is no longer part of the European Union and we don't have representatives in the European Parliament anymore um, but we are still part of Europe um, you know no one can change that however much they like like to try um, and we want to keep those close links. And there's one final thing I'd like to say, which is to remind everything that what the British government does and says is not necessarily, is not very often representative of the views of the British people. Um, we have, you know, we're, Westminster, where I'm sitting now, is known as the mother of all parliaments, but we have a government it was formed with the support of 44% of voters. That was how Boris Johnson got 100% of the power. Um, Britain is not a democracy. Um, we have real problems with the rule of law. We have real problems with the way things are going. But the good news is, the positive news is that lots of people in Britain are getting engaged, getting involved, doing just what everyone on this call is doing. And I very firmly believe that we're in a period of great political, economic, social, educational change. And that's great news because where we are now is, is a very bad place, but we can build something better. And that's what you're all doing today. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Natalie, for, for, for your insights and also for your warm solidarity. And, and indeed, um, we are anticipating a huge protest today in London. Um, one of the Black Lives Matter activists was shot yesterday and fighting for her life at the moment. So we're anticipating a big, a big uh, mass of protesters on the streets this afternoon. So, um, and, and also indeed uh, many of, of what you mentioned uh, uh, is, is true. Um, we are having, we're facing huge challenge here in the UK, but there's a lot of organizations that are now, uh, I would say more radical and more progressive in their demands, in the action, and also in imagining what should be 
an alternative uh, UK, a better UK for all of us. So thank you again, Natalie. So for our next speaker, uh, uh, by the way, I would like to remind everyone, or if I did not say it earlier, we are being translated into Bahasa, into Khmer, and also in Spanish. So if you look at the bottom part of your screen, there is a globe there. So if you need translation, uh, please click that. I, I, I hope that those who need a translation have already done so. I always uh, take it for granted that people know these things. Um, if not, I, I apologize. So now I would like to call our next speaker. Uh, she is from Podemos and uh, she's been a part of this in, in the European Parliament. She's representing Spain and she's a member of this um, inter, uh, European United Left Nordic Green uh, political grouping. And uh, she's also one of those that uh, we also count on to, to support our campaigns and our, our advocacies. So I would like to call Idioya Villanueva Ruiz um, to respond on the people's agenda on trade justice and corporate accountability. Is Idoya here now? Oh, she's having problems with her link as well. Uh, okay, uh, while we are fixing that, I will just move on to the next uh, speaker. So our next speaker, and then we'll try to sort out uh, Idoya's uh, uh, problem with the links. So our next speaker is someone very, very close to me also because she's from the Philippines and a very good friend. Uh, she's also one of those um, um, strong women in our Philippine Senate and has been uh, championing the rights, not just of uh, women's rights, but also uh, about everything actually, because at the moment in, in, in the Philippines, it's really in a very dark period where you have um, extrajudicial killings, human rights violation, left and right, muscling of the media, and um, at the same time, proliferation of fake news and fake everything. So um, um, unfortunately, uh, Risa Ontiveros, a member of our Senate, Philippine Senate, could not join us, but she sent us a pre-recorded message. So I would like to request um, our host to play that, please. The COVID-19 pandemic has further revealed severe social inequalities that have kept millions of people in poverty, which in turn renders them disproportionately vulnerable to the virus. This distressing reality demands more reforms in our social systems and relations. It calls for increased international solidarity and pushes us parliamentarians to do more. Much of my work in the Philippine Senate has revolved around my long-held belief in inclusivity and solidarity, especially for those who remain on the margins. The bills my office introduces bear these hallmarks as they try to institute reforms that will benefit the disadvantaged. Two years ago, we passed the expanded maternity leave law, which increases maternity leaves from 60 to 105 days, with an additional 15 days for solo mothers. This huge victory for working mothers, which was more than a decade in the making, was made even sweeter by the solidarity of organized women workers who worked tirelessly to ensure the passage of the bill. In the face of this pandemic, improving on social protection cannot be emphasized enough. With COVID cases remaining high and access to vaccines too limited, promoting decent work entails added social protection for our workers. In filing Senate Bill 1441, I'm seeking to provide life insurance and additional health insurance coverage for all workers in the private and public sectors who are compelled to work outside of their homes during a public health emergency. Also, 
our frontline medical workers who are overextended and suffering from exhaustion must be sufficiently rewarded. They also experience discrimination, like being driven out of their homes and barred from entering public establishments out of fear that they bring with them the dreaded virus. This prompted my filing of Senate Bill 1436 that will protect them from any form of discrimination and imposes penalties on violators. Our senior citizens are also enormously affected by the ongoing health and economic crisis. Adding to their health vulnerabilities, the community quarantine imposed by government that seeks to protect its citizens from the virus has negatively impacted our elderly since a majority of them are poor. In a crisis of this magnitude, government must see to it that it provides the necessary social protection to its citizens, particularly those who need it most. The Senate resolution I filed called on the Department of Social Work and Development to cover all senior citizens in the social amelioration program. And this notwithstanding the universal social pension bill for senior citizens that I've been pushing for the past several years. As a child of the progressive movement, I fully support AEPF's recommendation to institutionalize mechanisms for people's participation in decision-making processes affecting them and considering their economic, social, and environmental rights as commons. This has been a lifelong advocacy in both my legislative work and various efforts outside Congress. Grassroots participation in decision-making process is an essential component in any program, be it implemented by government or non-government organizations. Programs that apply community-based approaches are ideal as they encourage the participation of the widest and most diverse of community members. Program implementation and assessment, including the institutionalization of feedback mechanisms, must include the participation of the people if they are to be truly responsive to their needs and aspirations. The bill Gender Responsive and Inclusive Pandemic Management Act, which I filed together with all the other women senators, recognizes the gender differentiated impact of pandemics. As part of the feedback process, it wishes to establish an inclusive grievance redressal mechanism embedded in social protection programming designed to be accessible to and inclusive of girls, women, persons with disabilities, children, older people, and other at-risk groups. In my years as a legislator, from being the representative of my party, Akbayan, in the House of Representatives, and now as senator, I bear witness to the different shades of struggles we have experienced in passing progressive laws. And I'm also proud to say that through multi-sectoral efforts, we have been able to pass progressive laws from the Reproductive Health Law to the Safe Spaces Act. These are laws that have been born on the shoulders of stakeholders, advocates, like-minded legislators, and international solidarity. These laws have given us hope that in a world full of despair, Progressive reform is possible, but as we all know, the law is only as good as its implementation. For us to be able to effect meaningful change, we have to continue to work together, expand our spheres of influence, recognize existing realities, and make necessary adjustments based on these realities without sacrificing our deep held principles. And while accomplishing this enormous task, we have to make sure that we continue to be inclusive and that all voices are heard.
Okay, thank you and uh, much appreciated that um, amid a very busy schedule, Lisa was uh, able to send us that video. Um, I am wondering if Idoya managed to, to, to join us online or... or uh, si, sí, buenos días. Oh, great. Okay, so I have introduced you earlier, but I will do so again now. Um, so uh, I mentioned that, uh, well, I mentioned earlier, Idoya Villanueva Luis is a member of European Parliament from Spain um, and from Podemos Party. So without much ado, uh, Idoya, you have the mic now. Muchísimas gracias. Muy buenos días. Eh, tengo bloqueada la cámara. Creo que no me pueden ver por el hospedador. No sé si me pueden desbloquear la cámara. Pero bueno, comienzo porque será difícil para la traducción sin cámara. Ahora, muchas gracias. Buenos días, muchísimas gracias por la invitación y la oportunidad. Eh, siento los problemas técnicos que hemos tenido y lo primero, bueno, pues como bien mencionaba, formamos parte de una formación política, Unidas Podemos, que estamos en el gobierno de España, donde eh, esta pandemia que hemos tenido que afrontar todos y todas, hemos tenido la oportunidad de hacerlo desde el gobierno y donde hemos podido demostrar con un escudo social que, que se pueden eh, enfrentar los retos de otra manera, ¿no? un escudo social que ha tratado de proteger eh, a las personas, a las pequeñas eh, empresas para poder hacer frente a esta situación que, 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 bueno, que nos ha puesto a todos los gobiernos de todos los países en reto. ¿no? Eh, creo que es importante también contaros ¿no? que hemos puesto en marcha una ley de protección de infancia eh, pionera en el mundo entero, eh, leyes de igualdad y leyes del clima que esperemos que, que sean eh, importantes y, y faros también para la transformación que necesitamos. Pero en cualquier caso tenemos el mismo reto que tenemos en otros países, ¿no? que tiene que ver también con poder cambiar nuestro modelo productivo para, para que sea un modelo productivo no solo basado en servicios, sino que sea sostenible, que sea justo, social, económica y ambientalmente. ¿no? Eh, y respecto a la justicia comercial, precisamente, damos la bienvenida a la Carta de los Pueblos como referente, desde luego, para el trabajo que, que hacemos desde el Parlamento Europeo y creemos que, evidentemente, el peso comercial internacional entre nuestros continentes entre Europa y Asia es eh, incuestionable ¿no? eh, y este, este eh, comercio tiene consecuencias sobre millones de productores y de consumidores, pero desde luego no afecta a todo el mundo por igual. ¿no? Eh, creo que es importante que podamos hacer ese análisis sobre cómo afecta a las poblaciones más vulnerables, también los grupos más desfavorecidos en, en los países que están en desarrollo, pero también los más eh, desarrollados. ¿no? Aunque los acuerdos de comercio han tomado distintos nombres, acuerdos de asociación, eh, etcétera, con tres pilares teóricos que son el comercio, la cooperación al desarrollo y el diálogo político, eh, hemos visto que muchas veces se han basado únicamente en negociaciones que han tratado de tener acceso y control a reservas estratégicas de bienes naturales o de materias primas como el agua o la propiedad intelectual eh, y que han supuesto una apertura de compras y contrataciones públicas de los países en desarrollo por empresas muchas veces europeas o incluso la supresión de, de subvenciones a empresas locales que, que de alguna forma for, puedan competir en igualdad de condiciones con las grandes corporaciones de la Unión. En este sentido, eh, bajo nuestro punto de vista, en, en, además del contenido y de un alcance de, de, de agenda desregularizadora, eh, para nosotros nos parece fundamental que en estos eh, acuerdos de comercio sea necesaria la participación efectiva de la sociedad civil ¿no? y que desde luego se haga bajo unos estudios de impactos sociales y medioambientales vinculantes como, como no está siendo. ¿no? Por un lado vemos como muchas veces la Unión Europea ha intentado imponer sus plazos, prioridades eh, y realizar acuerdos eh, con medidas plenamente financieras de inversión eh, y no teniendo en cuenta, como decía, esos impactos sociales o medioambientales. ¿no? Y creo que es necesario y urgente apostar por, por ese modelo de comercio justo, ¿no? que tenga en cuenta como pilares la sensibilización social, 
eh, sostenible, como decíamos, social, económica y medioambientalmente. ¿no? Eh, que ponga en el centro el desarrollo humano y, y sostenible buscando el bienestar de, de las personas ¿no? frente al beneficio puro de las multinacionales. Otro modelo de comercio no es solo posible, sino que es urgente y necesario. ¿no? Y en ese sentido debemos de pensar y diseñar una política comercial como un instrumento al servicio del bienestar social a escala global. Para eso, eh, hoy me gustaría solo incidir en un, en un tema, ¿no? el impacto en las empresas transnacionales, las empresas transnacionales están teniendo sobre los propios derechos humanos. ¿no? Creo que ha sido una cuestión central en la agenda eh, institucional internacional eh, y los organismos multilaterales, porque hemos visto cómo las empresas multinacionales se han convertido en poderosos agentes que condicionan ya directa o indirectamente la producción de, de leyes en el ámbito estatal e internacional y se dedican a proteger sus inversiones sin tener mecanismos vinculantes sobre el desarrollo que hacen en, en, en otros países. ¿no? Eh, vemos un, como principal hándicap para acabar con violaciones de derechos humanos eh, eh, que existan normativas de obligado cumplimiento a nivel internacional que sirvan, como decía, para poner coto a los abusos eh, de, de, poder, eh, de poder empresarial. ¿no? Ahora mismo eh, solo creo que estamos en un momento de buenas intenciones, pero que hace falta pasar a los hechos y contar con esas herramientas que nos hagan tener eh, garantías vinculantes. ¿no? Eh, y, y para eso creo que necesitamos, como decíamos, elevar eh, la, esta voluntad política, el compromiso en, en la comunidad internacional, ¿no? centrar el ámbito también en, en la actuación de esas empresas transnacionales eh, reafirmar la primacía de, de los derechos humanos sobre los tratados comerciales, avanzar la exigibilidad, la justiciabilidad y la transparencia de los acuerdos, mejorar las vías de acceso a la justicia y a la reparación, incorporar también mecanismos externos de, de evaluación, entre otros muchos. ¿no? Creo que, como decía al inicio, otro comercio es posible y desde luego es necesario y urgente. Así que desde el Parlamento Europeo también seguiremos trabajando porque así ocurra. Muchas gracias. Muchísimas gracias, uh, Yedoya. And um, indeed, um, another trade is necessary and possible. And of course, we couldn't agree more when you mentioned that uh, we need to fight for the primacy of human rights over the power of transnational corporations. Um, transnational corporations are like the new empires now. They go everywhere, anytime, and they can do anything with less and less possibilities For, for parliaments also to, to um, correct this asymmetry of power between states, corporations, and people. So we now move to the next uh, speaker. Um, this time to respond on the people's agenda on peace, I would like to call Jun Ok Lee from South Korea. Hello, everyone. Very nice to meet all of you. Uh, I did work as a former minister of Ministry of Family and Gender Equality in the Republic of Korea. So it is great honor to be invited as one of the panelists in Asia Europe People's Forum 13, which I think is very valuable interregional space for sharing not only information and ideas, uh, but also the construction of a peer policy pressure for just peaceful and a sustainable world. I want to give my deep thanks to the organizers and especially participants who made a wonderful people's agenda, which will become our policy and the solidarity guidelines. I was hurt that there are nine agendas I want to share part of a practices and the targets related with the, each agenda briefly in the context of Republic of Korea. I will share. I share, can you share my slide? Yes. Okay, go, go. Yes. 
So I, I thought the first agenda is related with the human security first policy. Uh, in Korean case, based on my experience, uh, Korean government has created e-meeting for check and make policy to deal with the COVID-19 every day without weekends, cross-cutting all the sectors. Of course, Ministry of Defense became one of the uh, multi multiple stakeholders. During this process, the marginalized and the excluded sectors such as migrant workers, caretakers, burden and weakness became revealed and receive social and uh, policy attention. It has helped to prioritize the budget for social sectors and the human security. So it is uh, my the second. And uh, related with the agenda two, or uh, the common security uh, building politics of cooperation, so in, uh, during the process of uh, COVID-19 um, COVID cooperation, common security community has been created through information sharing. The awareness of this uh, necessity of mutual cooperation has been raised. Common security community can be constructed only through willing participation and the social distanciation. And the next. And uh, related with the agenda three, building solidarity for justice. So we have a very uh, newborn ODA, uh, ODA DAC countries, but uh, related with the uh, Myanmar cases, uh, our ODA policy became very responsive to humanitarian sector and the CSO's demand and the SDG agenda is because of uh, uh, Myanmar struggle, which is stimulate media attention and uh, civil society concern. So it is a new example of a policy transformation. And uh, related with the agenda four, uh, engaging into regional mechanism, I think awareness building on the nexus of local, national, regional, interregional, and uh, global became uh, very important because especially in this context of COVID-19, uh, strengthening the existing platform uh, such as May 18 Foundation, Seoul Democracy Forum, Korea Gender Equality Forum, ASEAN Youth Forum to cope with uh, this uh, People's Agenda 4 should be informed and reminded. Now I will go to next. Related with Agenda 5, Education for Peace and Human Rights, first uh, try to institutionalize uh, this education for schools, and uh, then more research fund should be allowed for the textbook development and uh, institutionalizing that education for the concerned government officials, such as uh, obligatory gender equality education by the continuous and the incessant engagement of women's organization. I will go next. And uh, related with the agenda six, uh, secure the space for POs, CSOs, and grassroots organizations. I think it is an ongoing agenda. The basic principle of support without interventions should be reconfirmed. Creating centers to bridge between GOs and NEOs has been working in Korea. Transparency in funding process is institutionalized to secure public spaces free from political cooperation. And uh, go next, agenda seven. More concern on people and environment, monitoring education and the citizenship education are working and it should be strengthened. Go further. And uh, agenda eight, the widening public concern on comfort to women leading to highlighting other victims such as the victims of forced labor and the victims of Asian orange. The holistic approach covering legal, medical, and the psychological support has been working. So we created the Sunflower Center for dealing with those things. And uh, related with Agenda 8, more concern 
on migrant workers and refugees, integrative approaches. So multilingual translation, we have uh, nine language translation services uh, and the weakening the legal barriers uh, has been adopted during COVID-19 policy prescriptions. So, so I thought, uh, I thought I personally have worked the academia and the local and the national regional NGOs and global NGOs and working in government also. I try to do my best to cross the borders to make nine people's agenda to be heard and taken as a practical policy basis, especially during the election campaign also. So uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Junok Lee, and also uh, thank you for, for coming early as well. She's the first of, uh, to arrive in, in this discussion. Um, I would now want to, uh, would like to call the next speaker, who is uh, from the National Assembly of Pakistan uh, since 2018. And he is a leader of the Pashtun Tahafus movement. I would like to call Mohsin Dawar uh, to, to present as well our agenda on, uh, or a response to our people's agenda on participatory democracy, human rights and migrants' rights. Mohsin Javed Dawar, the mic is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, um, first of all, for uh, inviting me into this forum. It's uh, uh, really an honor. Um, I think, uh, uh, as we have discussed in the start, uh, that uh, we, we, we have been through one of the worst uh, phases uh, almost in all the segments um, of our life. Uh, we have discussed uh, uh, the social, uh, economic um, aspects. Uh, and I guess the same is the situation with, uh, uh, with the world participatory democracy and uh, human rights situations in the region. Um, we have we know about what's happening in Myanmar and what what's happening in the Philippines, uh, as we have mentioned earlier. Uh, so it's almost uh, uh, the same kind of situation here, uh, and um, um, we have uh, we have for the first time like uh, um, seen uh, we, we have seen the uh, some dictatorships also in Pakistan. Uh, but still, you know, uh, there used to be some sort of uh, protection for the human rights of uh, the political workers, the journalists, uh, and other segments of the society. Um, I belong to uh, an area, specifically in Pakistan, uh, which used to be treated in isolation uh, till the last election, which happened in uh, 2018. Uh, when it was merged with the Pakistan and uh, it came under the constitutional framework of uh, Pakistan. It was uh, kept like a big hole and it was used as a, a strategic base uh, uh, for the strategic interest of the country uh, in, in the entire region like Afghanistan and uh, all the you know, war and terror and things like that. Um, but still, you know, uh, after even uh, many mega military operations, things are uh, almost like the same. Uh, we are still facing uh, extrajudicial killings. Uh, um, uh, we are still uh, facing uh, displacements. Uh, more than 10,000 families of, um, of, of just my districts, uh, they've migrated to, to Afghanistan. Uh, when the military operations were like, and these families are yet to be brought back. Uh, we have raised the voice in almost in every rally, in every forum, in the parliament, and almost everywhere. But these people are yet to be uh, brought back. And um, at, so, so, so we are, you know, experiencing a kind of a hybrid regime where the um, um, in fact, uh, there is democracy, but the actual uh, power lies within the military 
and we have seen the examples um, of that like when whenever the legislation comes to the parliament backed and supported uh, and it, if it is with the intent of the military it goes passed through all the the processes you know within within few days uh, we have seen the, uh, the amendments in the military acts it, it went through uh, the parliament so much smoothly that uh, the entire process you know, it was completely within a couple of two a couple of days or three days uh, and uh, on the other side if a private member uh, submits any legislation related to human rights it, uh, it takes you know it takes years and it keeps linger on in uh, uh, various forms when i got elected i submitted a bill on it post appearances and uh, it uh, it linger on for almost one year it, it, it didn't come on agenda and it, when it was brought on agenda it was defeated by the by the gold government because they, they, they outnumbered us so so, so so the same is the uh, the, the situation uh, almost uh, um, with all the segments of like politicians they, they are um, they're facing persecutions uh, state persecutions laws have been used uh, against the political workers uh, um, as a tool uh, to silence them one of our um, comrade and one of for my league uh, Ali Wazir. Uh, he has been in jail for uh, last five, uh, more than five months, just for speaking to Aurel. And similarly, there are many other politicians also who are in prison just for speaking and um, criticizing the military, the role of the military and their, the way they are encroaching um, uh, into the civilian institutions and the way they are micromanaging uh, the entire uh, situation now in the country and other politicians, David Latif and um, um, uh, Faja Asif and Fushid Shah, um, some belong to the uh, major, major political parties in the country. Um, we have seen uh, some worse kind of persecution of one of our uh, human rights uh, uh, defender, Gulala Ismail, her father and her mother were persecuted just for the activism of her daughter. and. They are still, you know, uh, facing cases. Uh, in, and if you come, we come to the uh, rule of the parliament, as I said, that uh, we are experiencing a hybrid regime and the parliament and the media and almost all the institutions are very much uh, in control. Um, in the parliament, uh, when, we, uh, when we want to talk, even, you know, even in, the, in, the, uh, in the presence of uh, uh, in, in this, uh, the situation of the pandemic, uh, where the parliaments of almost uh, many countries, you know, they, they thought and they, um, um, they, they debated that how, how we can uh, take the, the, our people out of this situation. But, you know, these things uh, were not discussed in the parliament, you know, they, they were discussed in some, uh, some other areas, you know, like which were uh, mostly uh, like controlled by the military. Similarly, uh, there Major, major developments are happening uh, in the region. There are peace talks, uh, you know, underway in the, uh, in Afghanistan, and uh, there, there is too much happening there. You know, uh, we have seen uh, some, the, some kind of uh, legitimacy being given by the international powers and the national community uh, uh, media uh, to the Taliban, and they are trying to bring them back and impose them. On the people of Afghanistan, uh, I always, you know, I also requested for a debate on that because Pakistan is also a, a key, um, a key factor, you know, a key player in, in, in this whole game. Uh, so, but that, that issue is also not being debated in the parliament. Uh, like the, the reps of the uh, U.S., it, they came and they just straight away go to GH2. And they discussed it the military high ups. They just bypassed the, the, the prime minister or even the, in other words, the entire uh, parliament. Similarly, uh, all the other stakeholders, they interact with the military leadership instead of uh, uh, the civilian um, administration. Similarly, uh, the militants are regrouping in, in the entire Pashtun Belt camp. 
and I have written to the, uh, the president of uh, uh, Pakistan, Islamic Republic of Pakistan, to call a joint session uh, and uh, call for a debate on um, the regrouping of uh, the militants uh, in the region. Uh, but still, you know, there is no response being given. And even, you know, after, uh, if you come, if you want to talk on the, on the, on the floor of the parliament and want to discuss all these things, uh, still we are not, uh, uh, most of the times we are not given the floor, even uh, when we start uh, talking, sometimes we, even if we get a floor, uh, they just, you know, uh, switch off our mic and uh, we are unable to continue uh, our, our point of view and, and convey uh, the, the message, you know, convey the actual situation uh, to the people. But you know the the one thing which uh, okay the same is the situation with the journalists also. You know we have seen uh, journalists being picked up. Uh, they have been uh, uh, They have been uh, kicked out of their uh, of their media houses uh, uh, for their opinions. They have been picked up. They have been harassed. They have been tortured. Uh, they have faced uh, like some uh, worst kind of. Uh, the, uh, weaponization of law. Similarly, the same is the situation with the judiciary. You know, we have seen uh, how uh, how the, the justice by this was treated, and we have also seen some other uh, members of the judiciary you know, who, who didn't obey the orders, or he was who at some time or stage questioned uh, the role of the intelligence agency in the military. And uh, we have seen, you know, the. Um, the way they have been trialed and the way they have been, uh, the way they have uh, faced the beta trial. Uh, so, so all these things, you know, as I said, like all the, the, the segments, all the pillars of the state are uh, under oppression and they are in control and we need uh, to form um, um, some sort of um, um, alliances and uh, international uh, alliances to to join our voices together and to uh, sit together. Um, but you know, uh, it is for the first time what we have witnessing in Pakistan here yeah, is that uh, people are now uh, um, they are now questioning, and it is for the first time uh, that uh, they know the true actually is responsible for all the mess, the economic mess. Uh, that the worst kind of situation which they have faced in the pandemic, uh, like as earlier it was, you know, discussed uh, the availability of uh, vaccines and all other stuff. So, so that so it is the, the only change, the positive change which we right now have seen is that people are now questioning uh, because of the micro management uh, the, uh, the military is doing. People are now questioning uh, the military. And uh, the, the the political groups uh, with the, an anti-military um, narrative, they they are very much you know uh, attracted uh, by the people, and they get a very loud response. So uh, people are now people are now participating. Also, the system is very much controlled. Um, the oppression is on, uh, on the peak, but uh, people do speak, and they they, they come out. And they know that uh, uh, what is happening and who is controlling and who is pulling the strings. So uh, I support the chart because I really uh, uh, discussed and uh, we need to uh, focus on all the uh, issues regarding the human rights uh, and specifically in the context of uh, of Afghanistan. I would like to do and that this Pashtun belt attached to to that because uh, the new emergence of violence uh, and um, the legitimacy given to the Taliban over there, it will, uh, it will bring, it will increase the violence and chaos in the entire region and we all need to think seriously about that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Mohsin Dawar. And um, well, we are now um, opening the floor for some questions. I have uh, 
three questions here on the Q&A. For those who would like to, to put your question, um, please put it on the Q&A and not on the chat because it might get lost on the, on the chat there. So I will just first uh, maybe read uh, two that is interconnected and then another one. So I will read three questions for this, uh, for this part and then let's see if we still have some time left for, for the other questions. So um, there is a question uh, about a concern and a question about uh, the fact that our politics is turning towards the right. And uh, so I think it, 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 the question is addressed to, to all uh, our uh, parliamentarians here. So how, how can we, well, how, what can we do about this um, to um, address these tendencies for ultra right um, emergence or strengthening of ultra right forces uh, in both regions? And, and then a related question as well is, um, it's, it's not just that in our respective countries, it's, it's veering towards the right, but it seems to be global as well. And then uh, when it comes to geopolitics, there is also a question uh, coming from Suwahi Babar. Uh, the, the first question is from Dr. Bashir Shah. The question from Suwahi Babar is, is that, um, on the question in the South China Sea and that the increasing tussle, day-to-day -day tussle in the region and that uh, the fact that the global actors like the US-China um, rivalry seems to be intensifying uh, because of China's movements in the, um, in the South China Sea. So what can the respective parliaments uh, do to uh, or recommend, recommend uh, to address this crisis and to um, maintain the, the, um, the decisions before the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. So what's the view from our parliamentarians? And then for this round, a question uh, about um, sustainability and, and climate change. Uh, how can we continue um, with a sustainable world with, with, with the, also with justice and peaceful environment, apart from what you've all already mentioned, uh, what else can, can you recommend? So I think uh, that's for the time being. And um, we have about, I think 15 minutes for this, for this part. So who would like to, to take that first? Yes, Natalie? I'm happy to go first um, and to start with a, with a message of hope with that first question about um, politics turning to the right. I, I think, um, and Dorothy, you said this um, in comments of saying how strong so many positive social movements were happening. I think what's happened is that centrist politics is dead because centrism implies leaving things much as they are. A centrist politician will just, you know, twiddle with a few things here and here. They change a few settings, but they're not changing. They're not talking about transformation. And I think the public really gets that continuing as we are, the status quo is not sustainable economically, politically, environmentally. So what we're seeing, and you see lots of commentary on this, is politics is splitting two ways. There's people like us who, as I was saying earlier, understand there's enough resources on the planet for everyone to have a decent life if we share them out. The other side is the, the right, and I, I would say far right, we have a far right government in the UK that says, oh, it's a difficult, dangerous, limited world. We have to grab what we can for us and ours and shove those others away, um, whoever those others are. We've got to build walls to keep them out, like Donald Trump said, or like you know, Pretty Patel horrendously talking about putting nets in the channel to stop the asylum boats. So yes, there is a rise of the right, but there's also a rise of people who are saying we want positive, hopeful transformation. And the question was, what do we do about it? I would say that we've got to be really careful about our terminology and our approach, and particularly our emotion, because our emotion is hope saying to people we can build a world where everyone has a decent life and we look after nature. The emotion of the far right is fear. 
they say it's difficult, dangerous, you've got to grab what you can for yourself. And so those are the two political currents of today. And I think when we look around the world and, you know, I look at not just Myanmar, but also you know, Thailand, um, having lived there for five years, I've, I've got a soft spot for Thailand. And I look at the, the people who are so bravely fighting for democracy in Thailand. I look at the young people. I'm co-chair of the all-party parliamentary group on Hong Kong. And it's the young people of Hong Kong who came out very bravely to fight for the rights that are guaranteed under the joint declaration. And it's the young people on the streets of Bangkok, the young people in Hong Kong, the young people of climate striking around the world. That's the alternative positive force. And I think we've really got to look at history. Um, we, there's a feeling now that, oh, um, you know, it's a difficult world. We've got China and Russia, and it, it's all terribly difficult. But in the past, we had a situation where what was known as the West, um, the global North, often spoke about being a champion of human rights and democracy, uh, but actually was quite the opposite. You, know, There was Western support for Saddam Hussein and Colonel Gaddafi in Libya until there wasn't. You look at what happened in the, going back a bit, the Democratic Republic of Congo, that was a situation created by you know, Western interference, destruction of democracy, Chile, um, so many places. There was not a chance for countries to develop functional systems. You know, in Thailand, um, there was very strong support for what remained essentially an absolute monarchy, and that's a problem we've inherited today. So what can parliaments do? I would say what we have to do is stand up for human rights, democracy, the rule of law without fear or favour. Historically, um, Human rights has been something people have used as a club to beat the people they didn't like for other reasons and say, oh, your human rights is terrible, while, you know, ignoring your friend's human rights abuses. You know, Britain says it's a champion of human rights and still sells arms to Saudi Arabia. Um, so what we've got to do as parliamentarians is demand an equal rights application of human rights law, application of the rule of law, application of the rights of people at a very found, foundational level everywhere and demand them without fear or favour. And that's what I think parliaments can do. Thank you, Natalie. From the others, I, uh, now, uh, can you, you can raise your hand if you wanted to respond um, or you can also just physically raise your hand like this so I can see it from the screen. <laughs> you know? mm. uh, first, uh, I thought the, the political culture to go to more right wing, it is related, closely related with the fear and uh, more protection in a certain group. So they want to exclude, through the excluding others, especially migrant workers and uh, foreigners, uh, they, they thought they can create their own secured uh, place. So uh, it proved that it proved to not be true. So in that sense, uh, some kind of more alternative or more valid, uh, some kind of credibility building from the left wing and the progressive side uh, for the protection and the, to, to deal with the uh, ordinary people's fear, uh, especially uh, job losses and the COVID-19 and vaccine issues. So it is better to uh, catch certain discourses which is closely related with the uh, ordinary people's uh, everyday lives. So that is one thing. And the second one for the, the, some kind of confrontation between big giants uh, between China and the US, I think it is closely related to number three issues. So not we rather we we'd better not to repeat the country-based conflict. Uh, we should develop our own positioning. Uh, what is good for people's interest, uh, even in relation with the South China Sea. So, uh, in relation with the sustaining. Uh, sustainability and climate change and uh, for securing ordinary people's everyday lives, what is good for them? So uh, not only following the existing uh, conflict jargon and the conflict terminology, it is better to 
deconstructs and reconstructs uh, the conflict from the people's point of view. Yeah, thank you, Juno. Thank you. So, so who else would like to, to take that question as well? So Mohsin Nawa, please. Thank you. Um, I would just like to uh, comment uh, shortly that um, all which have been done by the right so far is uh, using fear and violence in religion for their Western interests. Uh, but what what we think right now is that uh, in this era of information, where facts uh, cannot be contained, and uh, where you know all these. Uh, um, these projects, you know, uh, uh, cannot uh, be, you know, uh, implemented uh, silently. You know, things come on ground so much, um, and you know, um, in this era of information, people keep spreading their gets information from one end or the other, and uh, uh, so, so people are very much aware of uh, all what has happened to the entire world and uh, like how the religion has been used. Uh, the violence and fear has been used uh, to fulfill uh, uh, the Western interest by some powers. Um, there are still challenges, but I think uh, uh, from the recent history, people have uh, learned also, and uh, you know, um, everybody's sick of violence, everybody's sick of war. So there is no other alternative for them also. And uh, that, 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 that's what I think. And this, this is the hope uh, which we should uh, stick to, and um, and that, that's how we can, you know, we can we can oppose uh, these policies in future. Thank you. Thank you. I, I I think at this point as well, I would like to merge the two portions, um, the Q and A. And then also, if anyone or if, if, if the parliamentarians that are still here, um, apologies from Charles that he needed to leave for a funeral. So for those who are, of you who are still here, if you also wanted to, to, um, to give an additional comment on how to put all these people's agenda forward and not just the particular one. So if you, if you have additional ideas, you can also say now. And then also, may, uh, oh, I saw there are two new questions on the floor, so I will also add this on the, on the mix. So there is also a concern, and it was also mentioned in many, many of the webinars in the past seven days, that there seems to be um, uh, an agenda to, um, to silence people, especially journalists. And um, it's not just uh, filing sedition charges or, or um, controlling their narratives, but also those who speak out are also being given non-political charges like tax evasion or, or those kinds of, of, um, of, of charges that are not uh, actually, or, or, which are difficult to fight for movements on the political ground. So it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a agenda or a way to go around the system as well. That, that instead of saying that we don't like this or that journalist because we don't like what he or she's saying, uh, they're, they're, they're putting cases that are not political. Uh, and, and this is in a way as well to, to put forward, to charge them, to arrest them under draconian laws. And, um, and, and then lastly, there's also this, uh, this question also from uh, Talia Sisikasi on on Russian and Belarusian human rights. Um, uh, I think it's also a concern how we can move this forward. And, and, and I think um, how we can increase from Gus Miklat from the Philippines, how can we increase this kind of platform uh, to encourage uh, interface between progressive parliamentarians and also civil society organizations. So, so I'm putting all that in the mix now because we are on our last um, last 10 minutes before we close this session. So if anyone would like to say something, may, maybe Idoya, if you're still there, if you wanted to give a comment. Oh, 
or anyone who would like to address these concerns and also uh, yeah, further, further comment as well on, on the whole uh, people's charter, people's agenda in general? Well, if, if no one else is coming in, sorry, I'm, I'm aware I'm going first twice in a row, so apologies for that. But um, I think one of the things is to try and reach outside your comfort zone in terms of politics. And we were talking about local decision making before. And you know, people on this call, maybe you um, usually arrange outside COVID times anyway, um, you know, a meeting in the city centre, a meeting in a particular area of, of the city. Um, you know, maybe think about arranging a meeting in a different place. Of course, doing it online, you can invite a different range of people. Um, there is a, a, a tendency sometimes for people to talk to like-minded people like themselves. Look instead at branching outside your comfort zone, you know, reach out to maybe immigrant communities, reach out to poor communities, um, and try and make sure you're speaking in a language that's really clear to them. Not everyone may know what a Green New Deal is. And if you're going to start to talk about environmental issues, you know, a great place to start pretty well anywhere in the world would be to talk about air pollution, air pollution and how it's affecting people's health. So rather than talking on brief, tack, you know, abstract things like tackling the climate emergency, talk about how can we make the air cleaner in this city, in this village, in this community? How can we make the water cleaner? How can we deal with those practical things? How can we help the poorest people get health access to healthy food? So I think starting with the concrete, the everyday, and then broadening that out into broader issues is really important. And just on the, on the sort of journalists and safety, and I don't think, I haven't heard anyone, apologies if I missed it, but you know, what's happened in Belarus um, overnight is hugely and deeply concerning to the safety of many activists and journalists around the world. Again, we need to make sure that that all people are, are stood up for. There's a real fuss kicked up any time anything happens. Speaking as a former journalist, that I've worked for the Bangkok Post and I finished as editor of the Guardian Weekly, the international edition of the Guardian. Um, journalists have always been under at risk, but they're now at greater risk than they've ever been before. Um, and that's something that needs to be highlighted, but also to stress that um, mainstream media outlets are less important than they've ever been before. Everyone is and can be a journalist and, you know, assess your own level of risk, of course, where you are and how much danger it might be. But do what you can through social media, whether it's in an anonymous account and there's lots of advice out there about how to protect yourself if you need to do that. Um, to, to, you know, I deal with quite a lot of people from Hong Kong who have some very elaborate, if, if, if you find an, if I find an, an expat um, a Hong Kong um, protester, they'll know a lot about security, um, online security. You find out a way to protect yourself and just use that vehicle that's available to most people in the world now to, to get the message out. Thank you, Natalie. Um, I see that time is also running out, so you can mix your parting message as well when you respond. Uh, can I can I call uh, Jung Jung Ok uh, for your last comment and also uh, if you still wish to respond to to the concerns mentioned? So we try to uh, give these people's agenda to the concerned and the real people. So especially for the youth, they are responsible for their sustainable uh, next world. So give them this agenda to, to make it there in their own language and in their own way of represent representation because it is too abstract. So, and also try to distribute it, uh, all those kind of, uh, whether it is, even it is writing, we try to deliver this uh, each political party to any party who try to adopt a certain agenda among among nine at least one. So we will acknowledge them uh, to their political will. So and also the uh, for the for those journalists who have interest in. So this is very very special occasion in human history. So I think. Uh, uh, this 13 agenda, this uh, AEPF 13 agenda may not be the same uh, previous 12. So I think uh, uh, 
uh, we can use uh, create this e space so we maximize our voices to be heard through this agenda. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Julok. Uh, Bosin? Uh, well, I think all uh, have been said, uh, and um, I agree here yeah, that uh, we need uh, to go forward uh, with this uh, agenda, and we need to. Uh, keep, you know, uh, uh, increase, you know, uh, we, we need to uh, make alliances and we need to make uh, uh, approach uh, and we need to access more people, you know, to get a more uh, stronger voice and to get uh, um, a more support for uh, whatever, you know, we have been uh, uh, discussing her and for whatever we have been, you know, um, planning uh, for the future of our people. Thank you. Thank you, Mosi. Is Idoya still there? Um, can I call you for your last message before closing? I think we're having a problem again. Uh, well, this has been a very, very fruitful, productive, and meaningful uh, exchanges. And uh, I would like, I'll actually to happily say that uh, uh, for this morning or afternoon in Asia, we had participants and active uh, um, chatting on the, on the chat box coming from uh, Malaysia, from India, France, Philippines, Pakistan, Belgium, Indonesia, Myanmar, the Netherlands, Finland, the UK, Nepal, and Mongolia. So we have a, a good attendance from, from those countries. And uh, for the rest of the day, we still have the commitment session. So this time it's the um, organizations, representatives of movements, trade unions that will put forward the people's agenda that we have presented here with the parliamentarians. We also have an online rally uh, early in the afternoon. So we hope to see many of you there. Um, and uh, thank you very much again to Mosi, Natalie, uh, Jungok, Lee, and also Idioya. And apologies uh, to Charles that he has to leave to attend the friend's funeral, unfortunately. So uh, have pow more power, everyone, and uh, have a good start of the week. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much.